and welcome to the Friday show. So sorry that I posted this late. If you even noticed, I know a lot of people like to wake up and press play on their favorite podcast. Hopefully that is stand up with Pete Dominic. When it's not there, that can be frustrating. So I will do better next week. It has been a weird two weeks because the girls went to camp and now I've got to go or I'm honored to go. I'm excited to go get Julia after two weeks. Ava stays up there because she's a counselor for the whole month. What a great experience for them, but throws the schedule off. You do different things. I've been uh, having uh, a lot of time for myself, and it's been great. But I will get back to it next week and post this podcast for you, hopefully at night, so you'll be able to have it there late, those of you who like it then and early in the morning. Okay, today, Christian Finnegan, Michael Cohen, Both join me. Very, very good conversations with both of them. I think you are going to like them very much. I liked very much hanging out with many of you last night at the Stand Up Happy Hour Hangout. I think there was over like 40 people there. We might have done almost three hours, had great conversations, big laughs. I think we solved a lot of the world's problems as well as each other's. So good to see each other and just loved it. Always love it. Thursday nights, if you're not a member of our community, you can sign up for as little as $5 a month right now. Just go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or easier stand up with Pete.com and you should be able to navigate your way right into our community. And if your credit card expires on me at the end of the month, which we are at, you might want to uh, pay attention to that because that happens a lot at the beginning of every month. I notice that. So check on that because I can't do the show without your subscriptions. So sign up now and join us at the hangout. So much fun last night. We really had a lot of laughs, and it was it was awesome, as always. Okay, well, yesterday, Jon Stewart was again on Capitol Hill, and he made an impassioned plea for America's veterans who are suffering from the n- terrible health effects of the burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as Vietnam era veterans who are still suffering from Agent Orange. The headline reads, Republicans block health care bill for veterans exposed to toxins. That's just one headline. John Stewart blasts GOP for blocking burn pits. John Stewart rails against Pat Toomey, other Senate Republicans. And Military Times headline, John Stewart goes nuclear at Capitol after Pact Act blocked. So I saw that my friend Christian Finnegan tweeted out this video. I had seen highlights of his comments from the rant that he went on yesterday, but I hadn't seen the whole thing. And Christian tweeted, I thought I was just going to watch this for 30 seconds, but and then had the video there in the tweet. And I agreed and just retweeted what he said, because you can't not watch or listen in this case to the entire thing. If you've heard it before, fast forward, because that's where I pick up with Christian. But if you haven't, you're going to want to hear it now. And then on the other end, I'll pick it right up with comedian, writer, actor Christian Finnegan, who we love. But here, let's just listen to it and then we'll talk about it. It's like nine minutes. If you've heard it or don't want to hear it, you, you got to hear it. And it's worth hearing. This will be the third time, I think, I've heard John Stewart just rip into Republican. I've never heard anything like this. Here is John Stewart standing there in front of the Capitol with a whole bunch of leaders from veterans organizations standing behind him. Ball cap, T-shirt, John Stewart. So ain't this a bitch? Ain't this a bitch? America's heroes who fought in our wars outside sweating their asses off with oxygen battling all kinds of ailments while these motherfuckers sit in the air conditioning walled off from any of it. They don't have to hear it. They don't have to see it. They don't have to understand that these are human beings. Do you get it yet? Do we see that these are these aren't heroes? These are men and women, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. That we just let stand outside in the heat when they can't breathe. I'm going to read you something. This, this is beautiful. This is a, I'm going to read you something beautiful. You know what? I said a curse word and I'm sorry about that. That was my fault. Let me say something beautiful. There's a tweet from Senator Rick Scott of Florida from yesterday. It's beautiful. And I'm sorry about the cursing. And let me say something beautiful to make it up to you. I was honored to join the USO today 
and make care packages for our brave military members in gratitude, in gratitude of their sacrifice and service to our nation. And there's a beautiful picture. I wish you could see it. He's standing with a little package. Did you get the package? It's I think it has M&Ms in it and some cookies and some moist towelettes. I, I, I don't even know. Honestly, I don't even know what to say. I've been coming down here 10, 15 years. I'm used to the hypocrisy. Christina Keene will tell you from BFW. They, she sat in an office with Mitch McConnell and a war veteran from Kentucky, and he looked that man in the eyes and he said, we'll get it done. He lied to him because Mitch McConnell yesterday flipped. I'm used to the lies. I'm used to the hypocrisy. Senator Pat Toomey won't take a meeting with the veterans groups. Sends out his chief of staff. I'm used to the cowardice. Been here a long time. Senate's where accountability goes to die. These people don't care. They're never losing their jobs. They're never losing their health care. Pat Toomey didn't lose his job. He's walking away. God knows what kind of pot of gold he's stepping into to lobby this government to shit on more people. I'm used to all of it, but I am not used to the cruelty. They passed it. June 16th, they passed the PACT Act. 84 to 14. You don't even see those scores in the Senate anymore. They passed it. Every one of these individuals that has been fighting for years, standing on the shoulders of Vietnam veterans who have been fighting for years, standing on the shoulders of Persian Gulf War veterans fighting for years, Desert Storm veterans to just get the health care and benefits that they earned from their service. And I don't care if they were fighting for our freedom. I don't care if they were fighting for the flag. I don't care if they were fighting because they wanted to get out of a drug treatment center or it was jail or the army. I don't give a shit. They lived up to their oath. And yesterday, they spit on it in abject cruelty. These people thought they could finally breathe. You think their struggles end because the PACT Act passes? All it means is they don't have to decide between their cancer drugs and their house. Their struggle continues. Gives them health care, gives them benefits, lets them live. Addicts, veterans. Senator Toomey's not going to hear that. Because he won't sit down with this man. Because he is a fucking coward. You hear me? A coward. And like I say, I'm used to it. But this type of cruelty on those that we say we hold up as our most valued Americans? Then what are we? Pat Toomey stood up there. Patriot Pat Toomey, excuse me, I'm sorry. I want to give him his propers. I want to make sure that I give him his propers. Patriot Pat Toomey stood on the floor and said, this is a slush fund. They're going to use $400 billion to spend on whatever they want. That's nonsense. I call bullshit. This isn't a slush fund. You know what's a slush fund? The OCO, the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, $60 billion, $70 billion every year. On top of $500 billion, $600 billion, $700 billion of a defense budget. That's a slush fund. Unaccountable. No guardrails. Did Pat Toomey stand up and say, this is irresponsible. The guardrails. No, not one of them did. They vote for it year after year after year. You don't support the troops. You support the war machine. That's all you care about. Boy, they haven't, they haven't met a war they won't sign up for, and they haven't met a veteran they won't screw over. 
What the fuck are we? And now they're going to go away. Uh, Pat, Pat Toomey says, uh, oh, I've got veterans groups behind me. I call bullshit. These are the veterans groups. VFW, American Legion, IAVA, Wounded Warriors, DAV, and vets. They're all here. This is the veterans community, Senator. They don't stand behind you. In fact, you won't let them stand in front of you. Cowards, all of them. Cowards, all of them. Now they say, well, this will get done. Maybe mm-hmm. in the, uh, after we get back from our summer recess, maybe during the lame duck. Because they're on Senate time. Do you understand? You live around here. Senate time is ridiculous. These motherfuckers live to 200. They're tortoises. They live forever and they never lose their jobs and they never lose their benefits and they never lose all those things. Well, they're not on Senate time. They're on human time, cancer time. Don't you have families? Don't you have people who are deciding how to live their last moments? I know some of them. They've been down here advocating with us. They spent their remaining time advocating so that other soldiers didn't have to face the indignities and the depravity and the desperation that they faced. And none of them will hear it. And none of them care. Except to tweet. Boy, they'll tweet it. Can't wait to see what they come up with on Veterans Day, on Memorial Day. Well, this is the reality of it. I I honestly don't even know what to say anymore, but we need your help because we're not leaving. These people cannot go away. I don't know if you know this. You know, obviously, I'm not a a military expert. I didn't serve in the military. But from what I understand, you're not allowed to just leave your post when the mission isn't completed. Apparently, you take an oath. You swear an oath and you can't leave. But these folks can leave because they're on Senate time. Go ahead. Go home, spend time with your families because these people can't do it anymore. So they can't leave until this gets done. Because these people will not give up. They will not give in and they will not relent. This is an embarrassment to the Senate, to the country, to the founders and all that they profess to hold dear. And if this is America first, then America is fucked. Any on-topic questions? All right, there you go. John Stewart fired up on Capitol Hill on behalf of veterans. And as I told you, Christian Finnegan joining me. And Christian, I, I just want to start with your reaction to that, and we'll get to talking about, I'm sure, Plenty of other things, but I saw you tweeting that, and I agree with you, and you said, I thought I was just going to watch like 30 seconds of this, but I watched and wanted to just play for everybody that, that whole nine minutes. What is your, your rea- John Stewart, you know John Stewart, what do you think of him doing that? I mean, you know, this has been his issue for a long time, and you know, and, and oftentimes you'd be like, oh, these celebrities, you know, when they're little... Uh, what do they know? It's like, well, this is John Stewart's been on, on this, you know, the nine eleven families thing since nine twelve. you know, I mean, it's, it's the dude knows what he's talking about. And I think one of the things that was so impressive about that, that clip is just how his mastery of this issue, you know, like that he knows it backwards and forwards. He knows the players, he knows the, the, the advocacy groups involved. And so it's like, to, to see someone with a performer's ability to sort of speak extemporaneously yeah. and to sort of know how to hit a phrase and, you know, to quote unquote perform, but also have complete and utter mastery of the topic at hand. You know, you rarely get that. You you either get, you know, uh, a performer bloviating about something they don't fully understand, or you get a wonk who can't express it in a way that connects with regular people. Or and an so, old I mean, person. Sorry. Huh? I or said, what? Or a really old person. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, you get someone who knows the issue back and forth, but they can't express it in a way that you sort of the quote unquote regular man, the Joe Schmo, the, you know, Jane Q public can can really kind of relate to. So, I mean, obviously, just from a, a speech craft perspective, it's a it's a pretty impressive screed. 
potty words aside, but you know, we were talking just off, off the air, uh, you know, about Pat Toomey's response and he basically called it a slush fund, which I think John Stewart refers to in the, in the clip. But, but this is the shell game that, that Republicans play. If, if, if they just allot money for a cause that Republicans say that they agree with, then they'd be like, well, I don't, I don't disagree with the cause. I just disagree with this, you know, this unmitigated spending, you know, and, and uh, you know, the, who knows whether this money is actually going to go to what they say it's going to go to. Well, the alternative to that is to create a massive uh, bureaucracy, you know, like an IRS type structure that really uh, nails down and f- tracks every single dollar coming in and out. And then they would complain about that, about government, about, you know, about bureaucracy and about, oh, they, they want to run your lives. And they, you know, all this added, you know, that we need less government, not more. Like, well, you can't really have it both ways, to my mind. But uh, that's that's the game they play. And, you know, I was I was saying before we got on that, you know, I think that these Republicans have sort of realized that unless they're going to get called out by Fox or Newsmax or OAN or whomever, Unless they get, unless they know they're going to get blowback from the right, they just don't even need to address this stuff. They don't care. They don't care. They they don't even make the effort. Like hypocrisy does not matter to them anymore. And I don't know that they're wrong. I mean, they they really don't matter. And right. if they and if the and if the quote unquote legacy media does come after them, well, that's great because then they can just say, oh, the the mainstream media is coming after me. That so, is absolutely you know, perfectly said. Those two last points, especially are are well the the former one really is new that hypocrisy it used to matter it used to get you caught up and it used yeah. to be something people would point to and people would judge and be like that's you're contradicting yourself uh that that's a very hypocritical thing bad thing for a politician but what you just no, said about the, they don't care yeah about the you media know, I, I think i've said this in the past but you know the thing about trump that changed everything you know, or or that he was the sort of straw that broke the camel's back is that he eliminated any sense of a gag reflex, you know, that there used to be kind of this thing that everybody had and most people still do that. There's only so full of shit they can be without it showing on their face. You know what I mean? Without it just <laughs> seeping without them stumbling and them getting sweaty. You know what I mean? Like you used to catch somebody in a lie or in some sort of contradictory uh, point of view. And they, at a certain point, they would just be like, uh, 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 cause, cause that was their sort of internal gag reflex, just reacting to the dissonance of what they were saying and what they were doing. Well, Trump showed them the power of conquering that gag reflex. Like if you can just, allow yourself to be full of shit and not feel remotely embarrassed by that. The world is your oyster, especially in our sort of balkanized media landscape. Uh, since there is no one source that everyone agrees is any sort of arbiter. Uh, there's just, there's no, there's no need. Just lie. Just be bad faith all the time. Full of shit. It will, it's never going to do you wrong. Being able to blame the media at that point, too, is it's it's a win win. Yeah. Hypocrisy doesn't matter. Yeah. And now when the media when media complains about when journalists, when when the, the closest thing left we have to objective journalism covers it the way it happened and complains about it or points to the hypocrisy as a contradiction, they then complain. And when you talk about there not being any shame and just saying everything's political, the, the, the House and now the Senate wants to vote to codify marriage equality and the house did that and several senators including marco rubio who's so hollow that if you blow near him a noise like a wind chime will be made <laughs> and he he's saying and others saying is we don't want to play with these you know nancy pelosi's, pelosi's being political no they're codifying they're, they're they're making marriage equality unable to reverse that that's what it means it's not po- yeah and, and it actually does something it does a thing like congress passing a law that actually affects in this case lgbt married people's lives isn't politics it's actually policy and we can talk about you know some of the other policies that they pass too that affect huge groups of people and then they just say yeah. it's political but it's not political it's actual legislation that provides well, rights even if it is political what do you think politics is for, for fuck's sake? I mean, this is what politics is mm. meant to be. There's a difference between being political, like, you know, uh, this is what the intention of politics, the politics is supposed to help people's lives. And it's supposed to give us all 
uh, rules of the road so we understand what's legal and what's illegal. And if there's one thing that we've learned over the past seven years is that norms don't cut it. Th- this idea that like, hey, we don't have to make this a law because everyone kind of basically agrees in theory about these certain issues. Well, Trump and now the Supreme Court, the right wing Supreme Court have kind of shown us that anything that's not bolted down will be stolen <laughs> from you. You know what I mean? And so you have to bolt even, shit down. Even shit that was bolted down. Reproductive rights yeah. were fairly yeah. secure, uh, according to a lot of naive people like me. Yeah. You know, and, and Democrats are not without fault here because, you know, I think that there's a lot of people who have said, and I don't think they're completely wrong, that one of the reasons Roe wasn't codified is because they, you know, there was some theory that it worked as a fundraising tool and that having it as mm-hmm. an issue meant you could really kind of instill panic in people and get them to not just give you money, but also vote for you. And, you know, and so I think now people have kind of come to come to realize like, oh, if it's not literally, you know, codified into law, it's on the way out, you know? And so the idea that like, oh, you know, this is just some, you know, and it, even if it is political, it's like it doesn't take any more time to vote yes than it does to vote no. That's what I find so dumb about the Marco Rubio theory. It's like, ah, oh, this is a waste of time. So therefore, I'm going to vote no. It's like the time it took you to vote no took no more time than it would have taken you to vote less. So the fact that it's a waste of time, you can still say, oh, this is a waste of our time. But yes, I believe this and or I, I agree that this should be law or I, I don't have a problem with it. So sure, I'll, you know, so. Those that that sort of stance is just so incredibly dumb. But again, they don't care because they know that their voters will not call them on it. You know, at least the the vast majority. That's certainly not where the energy on their side is, is to sort of try to keep people uh, consistent. Based on on a lot of what you said and going back to the John Stewart thing, do you think, Christian, that like how often does a thing really dominate social media? news cycle for a day or, or or more that isn't January 6th or a terrorist attack or a school shooting like a thing like the stance that John Stewart the diatribe we just heard from John Stewart because you know he is the perfect person to be the messenger as you said for all the reasons you said about how he how good he is he's a performer delivering a message how well he understands the issue but how much does that create noise on the internet on social media specifically with an issue like that. i'm really interested in in what happens here these are veterans they're the most sacrosanct people for quote you know that on the right that gets that gets used you know for all the false jingoism and and patriotic pornography they always talk about support the troops and they have an opportunity and they're not and you gotta wonder if john stewart being the messenger is is effective. Can anything really make a change like a rant like that? No, I don't. I, I hate to be, uh, I hate to be cynical about it, but no, I mean, I, I obviously I really love that quote or that, that, that clip. And, and, uh, I re sent it around the way other people did and, and all that. But it's like, I, I don't see anybody who doesn't already agree with him. Uh, mm. they just won't even see it. They won't even see it. It's like, if you could, you know, clockwork orange style, sit down and, you know, strap your uncle to a chair and make him watch a bunch of that stuff. Maybe it might make a change in him for an hour or two until he gets back to his own computer and digs into the same sources (laughs) he's always dug into. But I, the only, the only thing I think it can do, or I think that the, the important thing that I think it can do, relatively speaking, is to just sort of galvanize the people who agree with us but don't have words for it they they don't that 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 they're, they 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 have a feeling that the GOP is full of shit about veterans but they can't really put their finger on it you know they they have maybe they live in towns where it would be uh verboten to even bring up the fact that the republicans are hypocrites you know there are people who they're not as engaged politically but if you give them a little ammunition at the very least it might make them just firmer in their beliefs and maybe make them get out and vote in an off year election where ordinarily they would just maybe vote in the presidential election. But, Oh, you know what? I'm going to vote for, you know, my house race this year because I saw this clip that really 
you know, nailed home how how shitty the situation right. is and how ridiculous these people who are elected in my home district are. You know, that's the only thing I hope. But but in terms of like changing minds, I I, I don't I don't know if I buy it. Uh, another political thing I want to ask you about, you shared on Twitter. I like Ben Collins, who covers like all the conspiracy, uh, crazy QAnon stuff. I think at NBC, right? He I think so. Yeah. He tweeted the 2024 election, presidential election, is going to be bananas. Op-ed writers who've written 57 col- columns about college sophomores ending liberal society with pronouns are going to wake up to see a third of the country has spent four years on Telegram trying to find legal ways to feed Tony Fauci to dogs. Oh, no, really, I agree. College sophomores are annoying and fewer adults should be reading their tumblers. Maybe we should just focus on how a large portion of the country wants to throw doctors in a river to see if they float. Just an idea. What are you following <laughs> and what is he saying? Like the, the, that the 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 virus of conspiracy on Earth too, just really wackadoodle stuff is not just a small group of loud people. It's a much larger group of actual active voters and activists. Is that weird? Yeah. It, well, and, 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 you know, to me, the whole cancel culture and colleges don't make room for conservatives and all that crap was absurd five years ago. If that's what you're spending your time focused on now, well, then I'm going to go ahead and make some assumptions about you. You know, that that, that you are... You have to will like there's only 24 hours a day. And if this is what you're spending your emotional energy, not just thinking about, but sort of tweeting about and writing about in your op eds and whatnot, there's like, Mm. well, then clearly you're hiding something. You know, if if my wife comes home and there's cocaine all over the room and like prostitute asleep in the bed and all I want to talk about is how she forgot to feed the dogs. Do you know what I mean? You, you can will you can sort of understand that oh there's something I'd rather not be talking about right now. Like if that if that's if if that's the end that the, the I, that's a weird I don't know if that <laughs> metaphor worked, but if that if that's where I keep going that it's like if my wife was like but wait what is going on why is this woman in our house like are you're you're on drugs now and I'm like but you didn't feed the dogs and I want to <laughs> spend the next three hours talking about how terrible it is that you didn't feed the dogs you know. You can make us some assumptions about me based on that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, maybe it's not a perfect metaphor because wh- whatever. I'm just saying it's like there are real problems going yeah. on. There's real stuff going on. And even if you do agree that that colleges are maybe not as welcoming to conservatives or you believe that people are being getting canceled and that's a huge problem. If that's what you're focused on right now, you're telling on yourself it's it's beyond absurd it's it was beyond absurd years ago it's now uh it's now an act of aggression in my mind to to even give a shit about that i i think that it's probably because it rates it's such a great easy thing to talk about and point to this anecdote where on this college campus this speaker got shouted down or this professor's idea i mean it's it really really animates people when you talk about it on the radio your show well, and it affects their lives in the, the people that they know in their circles the people in their sort of social strata that annoy them are the the cancel culture people the thomas chatterton williams's of the world's the barry weiss's of the world it's like the people who exist in their social sphere who annoy them are not people who want to murder school board members and are, they're not breaking up. They're not showing up at, at uh, drag brunch events, at, you know, and r- busting windows. And th- the people that annoy them are the ones who lightly are suggesting that maybe they stop saying, you know, retard, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, or whatever. I'm sorry to use the word, but just for the, yeah, the, no. the sake of the <laughs> argument, you know what I mean? It's like, those are the people in their world that annoy them. Yeah. Those are the people that they interact yeah. with. They don't interact with the the actual Nazis and the, the, and I'm not even talking about the official Nazis, but I'm talking about your uncle, your cousin, these people who have sort of bought into this, who are, you know, they're not exactly brown shirts because they haven't taken, they haven't gotten registered yet and they probably can't fit into the shirts. <laughs> uh, sorry, that was not fair. But, um, <laughs> But the sort of, you know, the sort of day to day rise in sort of extremism that people are either engaging in or willing to tolerate or rooting on that doesn't that doesn't affect the Barry Weisses of the world. It does. It, they don't come in contact with that. 
what they come in contact is seeing somebody in their Twitter feed, you know, complaining about dead naming uh, a trans person or, right. or something like that. And that annoys them. And so that's what they spend all their time writing about. Josh, Senator Josh Hawley uh, has uh, announced he's writing a book about manhood and masculinity. Uh, my friend Noel Kasler tweets, I bet Josh Hawley's manhood is a white sheet and has holes cut out for his eyes. Uh, let's see. Muller, she wrote, she writes, uh, I'm more qualified than Josh Hawley to write a book about manhood. How many copies do you think the Republican chairwoman in the RNC will buy to boost sales? But I just wanted to talk to you about Josh Hawley is writing a book on masculinity and, mm -hmm. It's called Manhood, The Masculine Virtues Americans Need. I know that you're really looking forward to learning more. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's just, I just think it's really cruel for you to bring it up without adding a pre-order link for me to, to jump right on that. What do, you, what do you even, I mean, part of me feels like, first of all, he didn't write this book. I mean, he sat down, talked to some ghostwriter for six hours and that person wrote the book, but the whole reason to even title this book like that is to get people like us fuming about it, you know, and to well, kind of create some sort of social media firestorm. Well, there's a place, dog agrees. there's a place for that. I mean, he was, he's going to be speaking at the stronger men's conference uh, coming up. Yeah. I mean, all this stuff is going to converge. It's already converging, but these, these sort of, the immigration groups and the anti-trans groups and the men's rights groups. I mean, they're all winnowing down into just sort of fascism. <laughs> I mean, you know, like yeah. you see it with the yeah. Marjorie Taylor green, the, the proud, the Christian nationalist thing. And it's like, they're just getting closer and closer and closer to just being straight up Nazis, you know, just straight up, like not even like, it's not even hyperbolic to say that they, they are very close to just being straight up national socialists at this point, uh, which would, of course, they, they would not understand that I was calling them Nazis. To me, it's just it's it's anti-immigration. It's anti-trans. It's CRT. It's they're all the same thing. They're all the same thing, which is that we want to try to reboot things and make it 1984 again with Ronald Reagan as president. And those are the sort of rules and norms that we are trying to reestablish. And I mean, well, and that's how I was being generous. They probably would uh, probably prefer 1884 to yeah, 1984. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I, that's, I was going to, that was the last thing I was going to ask you about. Did you hear about Marjorie Taylor green saying the Republican party should be a party of Christian nationalists. That's who the future Republican party should be. Rachel Maddow and about 8,000 other media outlets, the kind of a deep dive on the history of that term in, in America. But you, you, you basically just reacted to it, but what a weird thing to just out loud say, you know, it's such a, you're alienating everybody who's maybe conservative, but Jewish or not religious or whatever. It was just a, but that's what they want. Christianity. I mean, you know, there's there's no limit to how far this will go other than the limits of what people will vote for. And until there is a massive voter backlash against it, there is nothing to be gained by holding back and everything to be gained by being at the, the cutting edge of it. You know, that that for Marjorie Taylor Greene. There's no encouragement for her to moderate on anything. In fact, the encouragement is to keep going further and to keep being more explicit, more blatant with it. And it really, and obviously she's in a safe house district. So it's like, she's probably not touchable, at least in the short term, in terms of an actual uh, losing it. But, but, but her constituency within the Congress could be cut short by Americans at large being like, okay, this is bullshit, you know, and you can already start to see a little bit. I mean, I don't, you know, who knows a lot can happen between now and November and obviously midterm elections in a Democrat's first term are usually a bloodbath and it will not go the Democrat's way, but you can see the tide turning slightly. You know, the generic ballot has tightened up a lot and, you know, I think, I think there were some, one of those, uh, 
sites said that now Democrats have a 56 percent chance of holding the Senate, which is the first time they've been above 50 percent in this cycle. And so to me, I think it's it's even money at worst that the Democrats hold on to the Senate. The uh, House is still a reach, but you never know. And if the if the Republicans were to not take the House in 2022, I think that could be the thing that could could allow some of these sort of squeamish uh, the sort of pussies that are going along with this be like, all right, we need to cut bait with these people because we should be, you know, this has cost us everything. We should be running both chambers and we've been screwed by the Boberts of the world. Yeah, the the Lauren Boberts of the world. Well, 100 days until we find out the results of those elections. And I love your analysis of it. Uh, this I week, mean, you know. The, the the analysis of a fucking comedian who doesn't know shit about nah, it. You're, you're <laughs> not true. Talk to political analysts all the time. You're great at explaining this stuff, and you have a, always an interesting, thoughtful take on it. This week's uh, issue of New Music for Olds, loving it, always discovering new music. And uh, like I said this week, uh, no, nothing I subscribe to has made as much of an impact in my actual life as discovering this new music. So keep it up. And That's so kind. And, and so many of your uh, so many stand up listeners have have signed up and, you oh, know, great. have great donated. And, and I really I feel very thankful for it. And, and if that if that if I'm describing you right now, uh, I want to thank each and every one of you because I it certainly makes it feel worth doing. Awesome. <laughs> you know? Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Keep it going. We'll keep talking about it and promoting it and listening to the music that you're discovering for us in such a fun. Can I just say one? I, I was particularly proud of one sentence this week Go that ahead. I just want to highlight, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, sir, at the basically when I'm done writing it. I then kind of do a pass where I just throw in a couple places for people to leave comments if they want to or whatever. And I, I put in a sentence th that this week that I was very proud of. It was like, uh, uh, opinions are like assholes. I would like to see yours. Oh, uh, oh, <laughs> which, you know, how many um, did you get any assholes sent over? No, no, no oh. asshole shots yet. No, well, uh, folks, you know how to find them. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to Denies be your young. asshole, but he sh Christian Finnegan should be inundated over the weekend on Twitter and and everywhere else with shots of at least an animal asshole. I'll stand yeah. there. I'll starfish, start. starfish city. I'm gonna make a Sorry. fucking collage of starfishes and send them your way at the least uh, time you expect it. Hopefully, you'll be on stage and you'll just get in a picture of a bunch of assholes. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks as always, buddy. It was great. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. All right, Christian Finnegan, new music for olds. Go subscribe to Substack and allow it to affect your life positively the way it has mine and apparently a lot of other stand-up listeners. So cool. So cool. Thank you to all of those of you who have done that. Just another way to show Christian how much we appreciate him. Coming up next, my conversation with former Boston Globe columnist and now independent journalist and writer, the great Michael Cohen, who I always love to talk to. We had a great conversation about this giant piece of legislation that looks like it will pass through the Senate, then the House to the president's desk, investing in renewable energy and prescription drug prices, so much more. Really important conversation. But I do have to ask you first, if you're an entrepreneur, what's one of the greatest feelings that you can have? When you start building a team with people who care just as much about the dream that you're working on as you do, and they have the skills to make it happen. If you want to find those people faster, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract interview and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on all kinds of different job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. You gotta find great talent there through time-saving schools like their Indeed Instant Match assessments and virtual interviews. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. According to Indeed Data US, lots of stand-up listeners have been and using indeed.com and they've learned it makes hiring all in one place so easy because you can sponsor the jobs using their focus future. You can choose the talking points that resonate with you, and it just works. Even better, Indeed is the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring partner, delivering four times more hires than all the other job sites combined. Join more than three million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Oh, and by the way, in the minute I've been talking to you, 16 hires were made on Indeed. 
The right candidate's doing everything they can to find you. And if you use Indeed, you can be sure you're doing everything to find them too. And Indeed is doing something no other job site has done. Now with Indeed, businesses only pay for quality applications matching the sponsored job description. Visit Indeed.com slash stand up to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash stand up. Indeed.com slash stand up. Terms and conditions apply. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. All right. With that said, I am now happy to throw to my conversation with Michael Cohen. Michael, for years, was a regular contributor to the Boston Globe on national politics and foreign affairs. The author of American Maelstrom, the 1968 election and the politics of division. Co-author with Micah Zenko of Clear and Present Safety. The world has never been better and why that matters to Americans. And you should subscribe to his Substack, which I absolutely love. Truth and Consequences. It's truth and cons. Stack.com. You can find a link in the show notes to that and everyone and everybody else that contributes and is a guest on this show. Michael tweets at SpeechBoy71, and he's really great there on Twitter, at SpeechBoy71. Here we go, right now. Hello. Michael Cohen, please. It is me. The Speech Boy, please. The Speech Boy in all his glory. Hey, thanks for saying yes. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Pete. Always, without fail. You ready? Do you know? Do you care if we don't make small talk about our lives? No, we don't need small talk. <laughs> small talk is for small people, Pete. Well, I am a small person, so I'm. Trust me, I mean, I, I wish I was a small person. But he's, I, I'm working on it, though. You know, you know, oh, good. Watch, mm-hmm. watch what I eat. You know that kind of thing. Making healthy choices. Get. Making healthy choices, exactly. Well, except for my lot. professional, my professional life, which is. The opposite, where I'm making a choice to inculcate myself in American politics, which is never good for one's mental health. Well, that's true, but I'm hoping you're finding ways to balance it because I I love what you're writing. Specifically, wanted to get your take on this possible deal, uh, what you're calling one of the greatest long cons in recent congressional history. <laughs> And what yeah. it all means. And so I, I, when I heard about this happening, I went over and checked out your Twitter feed and you were writing all kinds of things about it. So I was excited because I wanted to get your interpretation. You've been watching these negotiations closely. You know the history here. You know the politics. And so I'm glad that you wrote a piece about it as well titled Better Call Chuck and Joe. You're referring to Joe Manchin, Chuck Schumer, and you're comparing them to uh, the Better Call Saul character because I guess this is a... Why are you making that comparison? Because I think they pulled a fast one on Mitch McConnell uh, is what I think happened here. Um, And they did it in a way that they kind of screwed over McConnell at his own game. So to sit back here about three weeks ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that, uh, McConnell, there's still there's still these negotiations going on between Schumer and Manchin on this possible budget reconciliation deal. Um, that would have involved that, that looks that would have looked a lot like what ends up being announced yesterday. Um, and McConnell comes out and says, if this deal goes forward, he was going to kill this uh, legislation called so-called Chips Act, which would have spent about which which will spend about fifty billion dollars on um, uh, helping the American semiconductor industry. It's a it's billed as a in in large measure an effort to to help American companies compete with China, particularly in the semiconductor space. So Connell says this, says if you do reconciliation, you could forget the CHIPS Act. This says, and then on July 11th, I think it was, Manchin says, this is, um, this is, this is bad, it's bad politics, he's killing a bipartisan agreement. Again, the CHIPS legislation had bipartisan support. Three days later, McConnell, I mean, I mean Manchin comes out and says the talks are dead on the climate issue. Uh, climate spending is too much, inflation is too high, we're not going to do it. Talks are dead for now. He might consider a smaller bill on drug prescription drug uh, reform, but basically the big bill that everyone hoping for was done. Right. Okay. A couple days later, McConnell, John Cornyn, his number two in the Senate, says, okay, we're back on the CHIPS Act. We can pass that now. I mean, literally saying, you know, now this is dead. We can pass the CHIPS Act. What happens? Eight days later, they, they or nine days later, they pass it. And then literally, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, four hours later, Schumer and Manchin announced they have a deal again on 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 reconciliation. The deal that it had they announced it before the Chips Act had passed, it wouldn't have passed. 
So, you know, at some point they worked out a deal, uh, Manchin and Schumer, and they kept the secret. I don't know when they did it. They might have. It's possible that Manchin's announcement that he was walking out of the talks was all just BS. And it was intended to you know, have the desired effect of getting Manchin to, I mean, McConnell to go along and support the Chips Act. Yeah. I don't know. It's possible. And you write it. You you write one, you know, way to think about that would be he knew that when he killed all hope of a a climate future (laughs) is the way I I looked at it. He knew he knew you wrote that he, he could potentially go from zero to hero. Well, by switching course. Yes, yeah. and that's what happened. And I, you know, I it'd be interesting to find out if, if in fact, the announcement that he made was July fourteenth. He was pulling out of the climate talks, uh, pulling out of the budget talks because of the climate issue was a purposeful effort. Uh, it was a lie. In fact, that they had reached the deal, but they were going to announce the opposite so that they could get the chips thing passed. And then after that was, you know, became law, which happened yesterday. They would then, uh, you know, well, I should say get passed in the Senate. It will become law when you pass it in the House uh, soon. Uh, and that, you know, once that happened, they could go, he could reverse himself and, and, and uh, say sports are a reconciliation deal that includes, you know, $350 billion in climate spending. I, I mean, I, look, it could have happened then. It could have happened in the two weeks between him, his initial announcement and yesterday. He could have been convinced. But I don't know. But what I do know is this. This deal did not happen yesterday. It didn't happen in the four hours between the chips bill being passed and Manchester making their announcement. They had the text of the, of the bill ready, all 725 pages. They had a press release locked and loaded describing all the provisions of the agreement. No, 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 no. This was worked out before. And they made a decision, the two of them, Manchin and Schumer, to keep this thing secret. And if you look at the responses of Democrats on the Hill, none of them knew this was happening. None of them knew this was right. even possible. I'm not even sure Biden knew it was going to happen. That's how impressive this was. And they kept it quiet. It, again, it could have been two weeks. It could have been two days. I have no idea. But the larger point here is that they, they made this announcement on purpose. It was very much very strategic. They did it after this passed and, and Kamala could no longer kill it. It is a really, really impressive <laughs> yes. feat for Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin and whoever else was involved. It matters so much, but in the end, we're talking about the the politics, the gamesmanship, how it was played, and we can we can and should talk about uh, what is in these bills, including the CHIPS bill. But, I, I mean, this... What does it say? Just real quick, one question about your thinking on politics in Washington in this current era, at least with this administration and and this Senate, because everybody pronounced this dead last week. And it was really depressing. Well, it's funny. Uh, So two things about that. One is I ran into a friend of mine yesterday, very liberal guy, uh, not a big fan of Joe Manchin, not a big fan of Chuck Schumer, not a big fan of Joe Biden, really. And he was kind of shell shocked. He's like, what do I do now? Mm. He's like, now I have, to, I have to change my entire opinion about all these people. And, and, and I said, yeah, I think you do. Um, it, it is a really, it's, it's a bit of a whiplash here because, look, two weeks ago, I, like many other people, you know, were, were withering in our criticism, uh, was withering in criticism of Joe Manchin uh, for walking away from this deal and for, you know, for walking away from, from the, the, the billions we need to spend to, to deal with this, you know, climate future of, of a warming planet. Um, and so he now is, as I said, he's gone from zero to hero literally overnight. But look, to me, besides Manchin, the real the real hero here, I mean, the really impressive work here is it came from Chuck Schumer. You know, I, it, I, Chuck Schumer does not get the respect that he deserves. He never has. And I, I pointed out yesterday that if this thing passes, if this, and I think it's, I, I expect that it will, he belongs in the pantheon of greatest majority leaders ever, alongside LBJ and Harry Reid, who I, I think is an underrated majority leader. Hmm. Uh, and, and you know, I, I, for a variety of reasons, and I have a whole bunch of theories about why this is, Schumer has never gotten the respect he deserves. He, he, he was fantastic minority leader um, during the Trump administration, kept his caucus together on issue after issue after issue, kept him together on 
Uh, the tax cuts, which was one of the reasons why the tax cuts were so unpopular, um, kept them on Obamacare repeal and replace and repeal that whole, you know, John McCain thumbs down situation um, and didn't get credit for it. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it's weird. I think Nancy Pelosi gets a lot of credit from Democrats and from liberals. And Chuck Schumer kind of gets ignored. Well, he is um, a huge, but, huge Jew. And, and he is a huge Jew. And if you want my honest opinion, that is a big part of the reason yeah. why. Well, that's why I said it to you. No, especially. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> I, and I and I it's funny. It's really funny you said that. because I wasn't sure I was going to go there. Well, I've always, was, thought I've always thought that I've always thought that I've always thought he's kind of like also not that charismatic because he's not of that, um, you know, New York Jewish uh, personality he has, which I, I actually like because I have a lot Are of you saying New York Jews cannot be charismatic. No, I, think I, I don't understand. It, I think it's annoying to a lot of the country. And to me, it's always been endearing. But I lived on the Upper West Side of New York. Like, I like that but i understand how other people it is in the end kind of a a, a a bigotry if you will because it's a it's frankly an endearing quality in my mind but you know i mean he does and i don't think this is connected i think you can disconnect it to i my biggest criticism of, of schumer has always been his foreign policy specifically the middle east specifically his kind of israel can do you know very little wrong attitude which does people do probably connect that and you can untangle that if you want but that's all i would say I I think that's a huge part of it. I think uh, there's a lot of anta antagonism toward Israel on the left. And I think Schumer is, you know, because and look, Christian Gillibrand is just as, as pro-Israel uh, as uh, Chuck Schumer is, as would any New York. Uh, well, Menendez large, uh, uh, in, in Menendez New Jersey is, is very, yeah, uh, I mean, but they'll and, have but, a but, lot of. It's a lot of politics, you know, and obviously the but I'm an antagonist towards towards Israel, but I don't have a, you know, a, a certain block of. Jewish voters that I have to win over the way that these guys do. We can talk about the politics of that, but I don't think that's any secret. I don't think that's a big, you know, controversy. No, but I think, but I, my point is, I think that any, any, any senator from New York, Jewish, not Jewish, is going to be a supporter of Israel. Yes, um, that's it, what it, I'm saying too. Or New Jersey. And I think, but I think Biden gets, or New Jersey, or, or even Florida, or lots, or California to some extent. But New York, New York has a large Jewish population, especially New York City. Uh, so it's going to be a big issue. But, well, you know, I think Schumer gets more abuse because he is jewish There's yeah no but you, you listed that. a good and we agree on that you listed a good litany of his accomplishments and and made the case for that but i think that the the biggest issue here outside of now all of that is kind of what's in this bill and i i, I want to just maybe move past the likelihood of it passing because it pro it will know in a few days for sure but you know, cinema, as you, you wrote about this as well, is not going to hold this up. She has no interest. She's not going to hold this up. And then the House, it, you know, I heard, who did I hear? Some analyst, analyst I respect saying it's not a done deal in the House. It'd be a slim margin, but they'll, they're obviously going to take it's the. A it's, it's a done deal. Okay. So you. It's agree. a done deal. So then let's get to just, you know, what, at least this is the New York Times, uh, Brad, Brad Plumer, who writes about climate energy and is great. He writes, the bill aims to tackle global warming by using billions of dollars in tax incentives to ramp up wind, solar, geothermal, battery, and other clean industries over the next decade. Uh, he talks about the co American companies that are going to receive financial incentives to keep open nuclear plants that might have closed or to capture emissions from industrial facilities, bury them underground before they can warm the planet. He goes on later to write, Senate Democrats estimated legislation would enable the United States to cut greenhouse gas emissions, Michael, to 40%. Below yes. 2000 by 40 percent. Yes. By, uh, yeah. By 40 percent. By 40. Exactly. By 2030, putting a nation within striking distance of the aggressive climate goals laid out by the president. Uh, and there's just a lot more, you know, in terms of what this bill does. But the, I think the important reaction, usually where I go, at least, is to environmental activists and what they think about it. And there's been a lot of support and some criticism. What are your thoughts about what's in it? So somebody, uh, Leah Stokes, who's, who I reckon is a good follow on Twitter and, and I know has, has, a, has done a lot on this and was integral in some of these negotiations, had a great point um, that the Obama stimulus plan in 2009 uh, provided the largest uh, investment in the green economy in American history, right? $90 billion. It was a, it, and it did a huge, it played a huge role in seeding kind of the, the turf for this green economy. The legislation that Schumer and Manchin signed off on yesterday. It, the climate spending is four times greater than that. Hmm. Four times greater. Hmm. It's huge. And what this spending does, not just, it's not just the spending, obviously, uh, it, it, it unlocks just a ton, potentially trillions in private sector money. A lot of this is, by the way, 
incentives. I mean, it's incentives, for example, to, to go out and buy an electric car. I've been debating for a while. I have a hybrid car, buying an electric car. This may push me over the over the line to buy an electric car. And if, if it pushes people like me to buy one, then it means car manufacturers have all the more incentive to ramp up their production of electric cars. So the, the, the trickle-down effect of this legislation is enormous, is absolutely enormous. So to my mind, like you couldn't, I mean, look, there, there are other things that you that, we, that I have to do on the regulatory standpoint, other things that you'd like to see that we're taking out of the bill by mansion. Yeah. But $360 billion in climate spending is going to make America the, the leading green economy, or I guess green manufacturer, I guess maybe a way to put it, in the world. And it is going to have this this spiral effect, this residual effect is going to be enormous. So uh, to my perspective, this is just huge. And and I saw some people, sort of usual suspects, kind of criticize, oh, this isn't good enough, this isn't enough. No. Yes, I like more money. Fine. This is still huge. And and don't don't poo-poo it. It's a big deal. Um, but in addition, you've got, look, uh, subsidies for Obamacare are going to ensure that people are not going to see their health care bills go up. As an Obamacare uh, customer, I'm pretty excited about that. Good, good to see higher subsidies. That's a Me great too. thing. Yeah, exactly. And I just, after search, I got, I got a, a, another letter from my insurance company telling me that my rates were going up for the for third straight year. Yikes. By premiums, I should say. Uh, yeah, every year they go up. Then, you know, you've got more money for IRS enforcement. I think it was like, it was like $80 billion, which, you know, is great for, for enforcing, you know, punishing tax cheats, but will also discourage people to you know, taxes that they know that a of them getting caught. You've got millions of prescription drugs that's going to lower prescription drug costs. I mean, this yeah. is a huge, huge thing. And, you know, is it as big as what, as what Biden wanted when he, you know, wanted two trillion, two trillion dollars, you say two trillion wanted in spending? No. There are things that are not in this bill that I wish were in the bill. Paid family leave should be in there, but it's not. And we're not going to get anytime soon. That, that is a shame. But there are a lot of important things in this legislation. And considering that where you and I and all of us were two weeks ago, we were staring at a future in which no climate money and Republicans to take over the House, they will they will spend not one dime on dealing with climate change. This is a big, big deal, a I'll, big deal. I'll, I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it. It's huge. A lot more to discuss. One thing you're going to definitely hear Republicans say is that it's there's going to be tax increases. Democrats and everybody else needs to be able to react quickly to that. And look at who the tax increases are going to be on. They're going to be like hedge fund managers and multimillionaires. Yes. They need to be able to message, you know, 99% or 99.9% of Americans are not going to see tax increases. Or anybody making less than blank are not going to, like, it's a very easy thing, I feel like, to shoot down. But Republicans will, and conservative commentators will scream about the tax increases in here to pay for it. How should Democrats and pundits and everybody else react to that? I mean, I think they just need to make clear that the, and then say it over and over again, this bill is going to reverse part of the Trump tax cuts. I mean, I think it should reverse all the Trump tax cuts, in my opinion, but it should, it's going to certainly increase, uh, it's going to reverse part of it. It's going to raise taxes on rich people. And I'll tell you something that I think is often misunderstood in American politics. Americans, by and large, love to see taxes raised on rich people. They are very, very supportive. And I, I you know, you, you can go back to 2012. When, when, when Obama ran for re-election, Democrats have been running on higher tax on, on, on the wealthy for the last uh, three presidential campaign cycles. <laughs> it's a popular thing. It's been a decade now. That was a big reverse in 2012. They started doing that. Because for years, Democrats never want to talk about raising taxes, ever, ever, ever. Now they're happy to talk about it because it polls well and it's popular. So, look, I think Republicans will bring this issue up, uh, you know, and certainly people will, some people will believe it. Uh, but I think the bigger message here, the bigger from a political standpoint, the bigger issue here is that Democrats finally got something accomplished, something major accomplished, which if you're going into a midterm election, which you absolutely positively have got to get your voters to the polls, this is going to help. Is it decisive? No. Is it going to help? No question in my mind it will help. Yeah, that's right? my... If you yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, well, that's my last question, which was you've been writing at Truth and Consequences truthandcons.substack.com that a lot about the midterm elections and the analysis and how American politics is weird. A few different great posts about it, but trying to find the, the specific part here where you, you know, you make the point that Democrats have to find a way to get people to fight apathy. They have to find an issue. You started just talking about it there. I'm just trying to find exactly 
this passage that you wrote about it. Anyway, do they do they have is a win uh, something that fights after it turns people out in the midterm elections? What do you see happening about the polling? And what about just the Supreme Court, you know, overturning Roe v. Wade and everything else that they've done? You know, there's there's a lot that could activate people. It's hard to know if it will. What do you see? I mean, I think it, 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 I you put it this live it this way. By and large, voters don't really reward politicians for getting stuff done. Mm-hmm. They generally don't. It's sort of you know, it's it's not. It traditionally has not been a very even when parties have an, a good first two years in office, they usually it's usually not enough, or the supporters aren't excited enough or enthusiastic enough. So in a vacuum, I don't think this is going to shift the trajectory. But if you combine it with, I think the already dominant feeling among Democrats that Republicans are a threat to <laughs> democracy in a very broad way, threat to basic freedoms like uh, women's rights to, you know, control over her own body. I think it, you put all those things together and it makes a difference. I mean, that's how I sort of look at it. You already have Democrats who, who, who are enthusiastic to vote because of abortion, because of guns, because of the increasing extremism of the Republican Party, you know, giving them more reason to want to come out and vote, as I think this bill does, can only help Democrats. So again, I, again, as I said before, I, in a vacuum, no, it doesn't make a difference. But combined with these other things going on that are already mobilizing Democrats, I think it does help. I think it's a lot easier for congressional candidates to go to voters and say, you know, look, give us two more years. Look what we've accomplished. Look at all the money that we've got prescription drugs for, you know, Obamacare subsidies for climate, uh, money for semiconductor industry, you know, look at the American Rescue Plan, all infrastructure, all the things we've done, right? I, I don't think, again, you're not going to, voters aren't going to just say, oh, well, I'm going to reward this politician. They might say, okay, you have done some things, and I'm scared shitless about the Republicans coming into power, so maybe I'll go out and vote. I, again, it, it's all part of a, a process of trying to get voters mobilized. And this isn't going to hurt Democrats. It could help along the margins. And when a race, a midterm that is going to be as close as this one's going to be, when so many races are, you know, uh, up for grabs, not actually so many, but where you have a lot of crucial races yeah. uh, that may be decided by a, a very narrow margin, every little bit helps. And this will help, I think, in that sense. Uh, in that vein, well, John Fetterman beat Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. Michael Cohen. I mean, I, yes, I think he will. Will, I think you will. Raphael Warnock beat football great Herschel, Herschel Walker. I, I think you will. And in Georgia. I, huh. I mean, I look at those two. I look at Oz and, and, and Walker as the two weakest public candidates in the country. I mean, they are terrible candidates. They, I mean, Oz is deeply unpopular. Walker, you know, is so ill-equipped to be a, a politician. Uh, it, it's a good senator, certainly. Yeah. But now... I think J.D. Vance is a horrible candidate as well, but I think he probably will win in Ohio. Although oh, that really? race is very close. Closer than I thought it was going to be. But I still, you know, considering Ohio's partisan lean, uh, it's a red state, I just would be shocked. Although I will say this. If they, you know, Tim Ryan is running for the Democrats. Yeah. Is the best candidate you could come up with to win in that state. Hmm. Maybe the only candidate, aside from Sherrod Brown, is the other senator, Democratic senator from Ohio currently, who could win in that state. Uh, and J.D. Vance is running a really bad campaign up to this point. He's not raising money. He's somehow, for some reason, he's in Israel. He should be in Ohio campaigning. He makes dumb comments all the time. Dumb, cruel, sort of gross comments about women that he made last week or came out last week. But I still think he wins. Interesting. Thank you for those predictions. Thank you for your time and analysis. Everybody can go thank you by subscribing to Truth and Consequences right now. Michael, always appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Pete. Always enjoy talking to you. All right, there he goes, Michael Cohen, everybody. Michael Cohen, that's Beach Boy is 71. Truth and Consequences is the Substack. Go subscribe right now. You can be a member of his great community as well. Always love when I get an opportunity to give him a call and tape those conversations and share them with you. Thanks again to Christian Finnegan. That was awesome. Everybody who hung out at the Hangout last night, everybody who is a subscriber, if you listened and liked the show this week here in the dead of summer, means a lot to me. Tell me how I can be better. I'm in that mode. How do I make this podcast better? How do I grow this community and give more access to people, to each other, and to opportunity? And how do 
I help you along your journey in any way? We all have our shit. We all live in the suck at times and are suffering some more than others. How do we navigate that? That is another goal that I want to try to achieve as often as I can here with the program and the community as well. I hope you have an awesome weekend. I'm excited to get Julia and see Ava at least for a moment. I hope you have something to look forward to and good things happening in your life. And if not, let me know. Let me know what's up. I'd like to hear from you. Stand up at Pete at gmail.com. No matter what, even if you do, tell me the great things as well. Always great to hear from listeners and learn from you. Hoping to get a few of you on the show very, very soon, including Gareth Sever, who is one half of the Bucket and Boards, Buckets and Boards, who have a live stream coming up that I'm going to tell you about on Monday and others as well. So many amazing people in this community, but I'm going to shut up and head off into the weekend. Well, I've got plenty to do as well. I'm sure you do. All right, shut up, Pete. John Carroll taking us out right now, as always. He was great last night at the Hangout, and he's great every day singing to us. Be the change you want to see in the world. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even. They knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See them flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up up. Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide and say stand up